our first high school summer talk. Um, we're very happy to welcome Professor Schaefer from Baruch College to give a talk uh, on the sum product uh, problem. He works uh, with high school students on some research projects, so he'll also talk a little bit about that later on. So uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Schaefer, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Adam. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'll share my screen in a minute so you can see my screen better. Uh, but for now, maybe let's wait a minute with that. Anyway, so I'm a mathematician. And uh, one of the part of my job is uh, to work on open problem in uh, mathematics, try to solve problems that are open. And uh, in some sense, this is the topic of today's talk. I want to show you a problem that it's a difficult open problem. You have some of the world's top mathematicians struggling in it for 20 years by now. And the mathematical community is still very far from solving it. But you can still understand it relatively easily and you can even think about it on your own. Um, yeah, as was mentioned, I also uh, mentor research projects, but that I think uh, I'll mention more in the second part of the talk. Let's first see a bit an example of mathematical research, current mathematical research. Uh, I'm at a bit, a bit of a disadvantage here because I'm not 100% sure what exactly you know and don't know. So I might use some mathematical symbols you haven't seen before. Maybe you saw it before, but uh, you it was a long time ago and you don't completely remember what it means. So your job is to send me as many messages as you like. Um, if something is not clear, you don't remember what something means. If I'm going too fast, please tell me I'm going too fast. I tend to do that. If I'm going too slow, no problem. Um, if you want me to clarify something, also, if you just have a completely different question uh, about what we're talking about, I encourage you, please send me messages. I love messages. Ask how this is related to pineapples. I don't know. Um, and uh, what else? So uh, let's get started. So more towards the second part of the talk, we're going to talk about other things such as research projects. Okay, so let me know if you don't see my screen well or if you don't hear me well. Let me just set up my chat also. Okay, good. So the problem we're going to talk about is called the sum product problem. What does that say? What does that mean? So I'm gonna gradually uh, I'm gonna gradually build toward the, toward the problem. And our basic object is a set of numbers. In case I haven't seen this before, I don't remember, these curly braces, all they mean is this is a set of numbers. This is the set of the numbers one, three, five, ten, And the order of the numbers doesn't matter, but what is important is that no number can repeat more than once. So we can't have the number one twice in this set, okay? And the sum set, which we write A plus A like here, is uh, just the set of all, it's another set of numbers. It's all sums of pairs of numbers from A. So for example, one plus one is two, so two is in this set of sums. And one plus three is four, so four is also in this set of sums. Can you tell me what else should be in this set of sums? What am I hiding here? I, I know you know how to add two pairs of numbers. I'm gonna ask you more difficult questions, uh, but let's start with something simple. Good, I see a lot of answers. Write me lots of stuff, very good, thank you. So yeah, so people are saying it should be six and uh, eight and uh, 10 and 20 and 11. Hopefully I wrote this correctly. Uh, let me know if you think I made some mistake. This is the sum set in this case, the set of all sums of pairs of elements from A. Now, we don't really care about what numbers exactly are in this sum set. We care how many sums there are, how many different sums. So notice, for example, that, um, let's see, 
uh, 1 plus 5 is 6, and 3 plus 3 is also 6. It's the same thing, but we only included 6 once. So it doesn't matter how many times the sum repeats, it's only there once. So the size of the sum set captures how many times distance repeat in sum set. If, if there are a lot of repetitions, it will be small. If there are a lot of different sum, it will be large. What's the size of the sum set in this case? The size just means how many numbers are in it. Okay, size of the set is just how many numbers. Good. Good, I see people telling me the correct answer. Very good. So you can just count how many numbers. There are nine numbers here. So that's the size of this sum set. It's nine. Now, I care about the extreme cases. What do I mean by the extreme cases? I want to know how large it can be. And I also want to know how small it can be. I don't care. Um, what is the maximum size that the sum set can have? Okay, you understand the question? For any set of n numbers, you can choose whatever you want. What's the maximum size? How large can this sum? Something wasn't clear? Please ask. Um, so, I see a lot of nice answers. Very good. Uh, so, what's the worst case intuitively? Intuitively, the worst case is that the numbers in A are very different from each other. They're kind of random set of numbers with no connections between them. And then no sum will repeat twice, right? If I just take a lot of very different numbers, I don't expect it, such that no sum it repeats in two different ways. You know what, let me wait with this for a second. Um, so every pair of numbers from A will give me a different sum, right? I can take the first two numbers, I get uh, one sum. I take another pair of numbers, I'll get a different sum. So how many pairs of numbers are in A? Uh, so you want, might want to tell me and choose two, the number of ways of checking two numbers. See some people wrote it to me, it's very, very good. It's almost the answer. Uh, the answer is actually this. Why, why this? Uh, so it's the n plus one choose two or this expression in the right if you prefer. Why is that? Because I have n choose two ways of taking two numbers, but I also have the option of taking the same number twice. And if you, if you count it properly, you'll see that the total number of options is n plus one choose two. Uh, some people wrote this to me, very good. Even if you didn't see exactly why it's n plus one choose two, but you see why n choose two makes sense, good. Okay, questions so far? So, so in some sense, the maximum size is when no no, I don't have two different ways of getting the same sum. Most sets would be like this. If you randomly choose n numbers, you don't expect many sums to repeat more than once. The chances that I took two numbers that sum to 10 and then two other numbers that sum to 10 is very small. So, so most sets of n numbers will have, let's call it about n square sums. It's n square choose n square over two, we don't care. It's about n square. Okay, so, so most sets, the sum set is about n squared. But some other sets of numbers behave very differently. They can have a very small sum set. So let's ask the opposite direction. I have a set of a lot of numbers, n numbers. What is the minimum size that the sum set can have? So it's kind of, it's harder to say that. It's harder to talk about a minimum, so maybe we'll start with something easier. Can you give me a specific set? Give me one set of numbers that have, one set of n numbers, and it's very large, that has a small number of sums, okay? What, what set A of n numbers uh, might have a small number of sums? Yeah, uh, good. A lot of people are suggesting the numbers have to be distinct. Yes, the number in a set are always distinct. Someone asked this. Yes, it's important. No, so, no, so now you imagine that n is a very large number, okay? You don't assume that n is 1. You assume that n is, I don't know, something very large, a billion. And you want an answer in uh, terms of n. So several people suggested consecutive integers. And, and that's a good idea. 
Okay, I, I got a lot of questions, so let me, let me just stop and say, the numbers can be whatever you want. They can be negative, they can be irrational, they can be zero, everything is allowed. Um, so several people suggested, let's take one, two, three, four, all the way up to n. So that's n consecutive integers. Okay, so if I took these numbers, it works for any n, right? Any large n that you take, you can say, let's take the numbers one, two, three, up to n. How will the sum set look like? Can you tell me what sums are in the sum set in this case? I'm giving people a moment to tell me what are the numbers in the sum. So, so what's the smallest number here? What's the smallest number in this sum set? By the, can you tell me? Right, it, we don't have one, we have two, right? One plus one is two. That's the smallest you can have. What's next there? Oh, I see a lot of people writing to me the answer. Very good, thank you everyone for participating. Makes me happy. Okay, so the, it's, the answer is all the numbers between two and two n because one plus one is two, one plus two is three, one plus three is four. You can keep going until you get n plus n is 2n. Do you see why this is the sum set in this case? Does it make sense? Let me know if you're not sure why I got this answer. What's the size? So, okay, if you're not familiar with this notation here, absolute value of a set, that means the size of a set. If we put a set in absolute value notation, it means how many elements are in it, how many numbers. How many numbers are in this set? Can you tell me? Uh, a lot of people tell me the right answer. Very good. Very good. Okay, so how many numbers are here? So it's 2n minus 1. Why is it 2n minus 1? An easy way to see this, if it was 1, 2, 3 up to 2n, that would have been 2n numbers, right? But 1 is excluded, so 2n minus 1. Okay? So if you, because we don't include one, it's two n minus one. Are you okay with this? Ask questions if this is not clear how I got this. Okay, so we have a set, so, so that's interesting. Um, almost every set of n numbers is gonna have a very large sum set, about n squared. But we just found a set that has about two n minus one. Do you think we can do better? Or, or this is the best we can do? Can we find a set with a smaller sum set? Any guesses? Hmm, interesting. I like, the, I like your guesses. Um, so just, to, just in case it's not completely clear, uh, we're, we have to have n different numbers, okay? The rule is we have to have n different numbers. It cannot repeat or something like that. Um, I see all sorts of people suggesting to add negative numbers and to add zero. These are great ideas. I, I would have, that's the first thing I would have tried also. So actually we cannot, let's prove that we cannot claim for any set A of N numbers, doesn't matter what you put in it. You can put in negative numbers or zero or any other number that you like. The size of the sum set is always at least 2n minus 1. You cannot, base, so this, the set we had in the previous slide was the best you can do. So why is that? Any thoughts? How can I prove such a thing? Maybe, let, let's try to come up with ideas. How can we prove that no matter what I put in the set, no matter what, I can, I can go with any numbers. The weirdest thing you can come up with I'll still always have at least 2n minus 1 numbers. Oh, I see a lot of nice suggestions. I like your ideas. Very good. Okay. I want to give you a small hint. It's, it's really no hint at all, but it just makes things look simpler. Let's give the numbers names. Let's say that I call my set A, I call the numbers in it A1, A2, A3, up to AN. Okay, I just call, gave them names and I ordered them to be uh, 
increasing. So A1 is the smallest, A2 is the second smallest, A3 is the third smallest. Okay, so now that I have names for my numbers, I love your suggestions. Keep sending me more things in the chat, please. Uh, they don't have to be consecutive, no. They can be anything you like. They don't have to be integers even. Okay, uh, can you give me examples of some, how can, do I have several different sums here that are always different from each other? I wanna show that there are always many different sums. What sums are always gonna be different from each other? Uh, maybe, maybe I'll first ask you this. What is the smallest sum here? What's the smallest sum that's gonna be in A plus A? Smallest sum, so definitely smaller than everything else. Oh, very good, I love your answers. Uh, remember that we're allowed to add an element to itself. The two elements don't have to be different. Very good, thank you all for your answers. Yes. So, like many of you said, the smallest number is A1 plus A1, always. Doesn't matter what's in this set, the smallest sum is always A1 plus A1. What's the second smallest? What is going to be the second smallest sum? Ah, very good. Very good, I'm happy to see a lot of people are following what I'm saying here. The second smallest, no matter what our numbers are, is always going to be A1 plus A2. Do you see why? Does it make sense? Do you see why this is the case? If it's not clear, uh, let me know. Now the third one is already not unique. It can be different things in different sets. But, but we already got something interesting. We already showed that there are always at least two different sums. Because A minus A1 plus A1 is always the smallest, A1 plus A2 is always larger. Can you give me a third sum that's always gonna be bigger than both of these? What's always gonna be bigger than both of these? Oh, very good, very good ideas. Yes. So, good. So here's an example of a lot of sums. Oops, too much, okay. Here is an example of a lot of sums, n sums, and they're always gonna be different because you can always organize them in strictly increasing order. So they cannot be identical, right? A1 plus A1 is always smaller Strictly smaller than A1 plus A2, strictly smaller than A1 plus A3, and so on. So this is a proof that every set A, the sum set will have at least N different sums, right? Do you see why this tells us that for any set A, there are always at least N different sums? We always have these N different sums, but we want 2N minus one. So how do I go from N to 2N minus one? What's missing here? So these are n sums, these are n sums, and they're always gonna be different for any sum set, any set. Yes, very good. Oh, can I repeat the question? Okay, so the question was, can we prove that no, for any set A of n numbers, the sum set is always at least two n minus one, and no matter how, it can be zero or negative number, you can have pi there, whatever you want. Doesn't matter what happens there. The sum set is always at least n different sums. There are always at least n different sums of two numbers from the set. So we, we already saw here in purple, we already saw here in purple that uh, there are always at least n different sums because these, doesn't matter what the numbers in the set, they're always gonna be different. Oh, a lot of you gave me good ideas. Um, so I see some people suggested now taking A2 plus everything. That's a bit tricky because A2 plus A2 might accidentally be the same as A1 plus A3, for example, So or A1 plus A4. So it might be some we already saw. But most of you said very good things. I can just take this. Now, A2 plus An, A3 plus An, A4 plus An, up to An plus An. So we have here a chain of two and minus one different sums, and all of them must be different because we can order them. We know always 
which is bigger than which. So they cannot be the same, no two can be the same. And if you try the example from our previous slide, you'll see that indeed these exactly give you all of the sums in our previous slide. We had 2n minus 1 sums in that set, everything from 2 up to 2n, and this will give you exactly everything from 2 up to 2n. Do you see how we prove this? This is the end of the proof. Every, sum, every set A of n numbers leads us to at least 2n minus 1 different sums. Okay, do you want me to repeat anything? Is anything unclear? Okay, so let's continue a bit. Um, so we just said we proved any set of n numbers leads us to a sum set of size at least 2n minus 1. And we have an example, we have an example that showed that this is best possible. If we took, we take a to b, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to n, the sum set is 2, 3, 4, up to 2n, so it is 2n minus 1, so there's no hope of improving our, our proof. That's the best possible. But is this the only set that's minimal? Is 1, 2, 3, up to n the unique set that leads us to 2n minus 1? I, I see a lot of people saying very good stuff. Um, yeah, very nice. Uh, I love your answers. Okay, so I'm gonna I, I'm gonna give a lot of people are telling me complete answer. I'm gonna do it a bit slower than a complete answer. Oh, very good ideas you have. So one idea is what about this set? What about let's take the set. Let's call it B. So it would be a different set. I took A and I increased every number by four. Okay, I took A and instead of having one, and, and I basically added plus four to all of the numbers in A. How does that change the sum set? If I added four to all the numbers in A, what will happen to all the sums? Very good. If I did every number got plus four, so every sum gets, every sum is two numbers, right? If each of the two numbers increased by four, if both numbers increased by four, together it increases by eight. Very good. So the sum set is the same as before, except plus eight to everything. Every number increased by four, every sum of two numbers increased by eight. Are you with, again, let me know if you're not with me. I get a lot of answers here, a lot of good answers, so I, so it's easy for me to, to jump forward, but maybe other people still want me to clarify. So just let me know. I'm here to clarify. Okay. So, so good. This is a special case of, in some sense, if you think of the number line, of these numbers on the number line, I just pushed everything a bit to the right. And every change of the set by a constant works, right? I can add y4. I can add 5 or pi or negative number. It will always work. The size of the sum set will always remain the same. It's just that all of the numbers in it change by the same amount. Okay, so what else can I do? One thing I can do is change all the numbers by the same amount, add the same number to everything, whatever number I like. Do you see this? Can you think of something else I can do? Not just adding the same thing to everything, there's something else I can try to do. Ah, very good. Uh, Yes, a lot of people are jumping ahead already to what I'm going to say in the next slide. Very good, I see you're with me. Yes, what I can do is multiply by some number. Here's an example. I multiplied all the numbers in A by 2. It's the same set as A, everything is times 2. If I multiply all the numbers in A, in A by 2, how does this affect the sum set? What happens to the sum set? What happens to the sum set? Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. I see a lot of good answers. Excellent. So now, if every number is multiplied by two, the sum is also multiplied by two. It's the same thing. Uh, if I have two plus two, that's four. If I have four plus four, it's eight, right? The sum is multiplied by two. Are we good with this? 
Okay, so let's, so these were just a few examples. Let's try to generalize. If I add a constant number to everything, still remains there, two n minus one. If I multiply everything by the same thing, still remains two n minus one sums. Can you generalize things? Actually, many people already told me the answer before. Two n minus one sums will happen for any what? What, a, what is the, exactly, yes. He's saying a lot of great things. I asked, I've been asked to go back to the previous slide. So let's go for a second to the previous slide. The sums now look like this. If I multiplied all the numbers by two, then two plus two is four, two plus four is six, two plus, six is eight, etc. Yeah, thank you for asking me to go back. I, uh, whenever you want me to, to repeat something, just let me know. A lot of people told me the answer. Very good observation. This happens to all sets of numbers that are in arithmetic progression or in arithmetic sequence. Some people wrote arithmetic series, which is Series usually means that it's an infinite set of numbers. So it's also correct as long as we stop it at some point. So all of these are examples of arithmetic progressions. Remember what an arithmetic progression are? It's you start from some number and each time you add the same quantity. Again and again. Okay. So, so I wanna say something here. Maybe, maybe the philosophy behind this is most sets of n numbers are gonna have a very large sum set. Most sets of n numbers, their sum set is gonna be close to n squared. n squared over two, n squared over three, but I don't care. Close to n squared. When n is huge, the, the over two or over three are relatively, have a relatively small effect. But there are sets that have, let's call it additive structure. They have some sort of special structure that makes their sum set very small and they're rare. Most sets are not gonna have this property. Okay, um, so, so in this case, it was easy in a sense. The minimum size of the sum set is two n minus one. And you can also show that this is only obtained by arithmetic progressions. But if you slightly change the problem, it becomes a difficult open problem. Let's say that now instead of the minimum 2n minus one, I wanna characterize what sets of n numbers their sum set has at most three n elements or 10n or a million n. How do I find which sets have at most 10n sums? This is much more difficult. Um, for example, there's something you probably did not hear about that's called a generalized arithmetic progression. Generalized arithmetic progression. These are sets that are not arithmetic progression. There's something weirder. They still have a small sum set. Not two n minus one, but still some small constant times n. And characterizing what sets have a small sum set like this is very useful. It affects a lot of things not just in pure math, for example, in theoretical computer science, it's helpful in all sorts of situations to know what sets have a small sum set. This is, I don't know if you heard this term before, this for, this for example, helpful in uh, something that's called property testing. And we don't know, this is an open problem, but, uh, but I'm not going to, to talk about this open problem today. I said I'm gonna talk about a problem called the sum product problem. So we know what sum sets are. Product sets are almost the same. Um, if we have a set of numbers A, the product set is the set of all products of pairs of numbers from it. And we call it A times A, like here, A times A. So one times one is three, one times three is three. I'm sure you can tell me some more numbers that should be in the product set, right? It's just, multiplying more pairs of numbers. And it doesn't matter if you can get something in two different ways, it's only there once. Good, I see a lot of answers. Very nice, thank you. 
good. I'm happy to see a lot of people are with me. So let me know if I messed up anything when I wrote this slide. Uh, this is what I thought was the product set. Okay, so it's very similar to a sum set, just with a product. Okay, so what can we say about the maximum and minimum sizes? Let's do this again, it's very similar. What is the maximum size? What's the maximum size that a product set can have for a set of n numbers? Any numbers that you like, what's the maximum size that the product set can have? Mm -hmm. When will we have a lot of products? Can you tell me when we'll have a lot of product? Different, a lot of, uh, when will this? Yes, very good. Do you understand the difference? Is it okay when uh, it's just the product of all pairs of elements? Oh, I have a lot of nice answers here. I like it. Very nice. Very nice. Um, right, so the the largest case is when every product of two numbers is different and i see a lot of great suggestions here for example i see we can take n prime numbers we can take relatively prime numbers you have great ideas but it's actually much easier to find a set with about this number most sets will have this number if you ask a computer to give you a set of any rational numbers randomly, most likely you'll get a set like this. Because when you choose numbers randomly, the chances that you get two pairs that multiply to the same thing is very small. Okay. What about a small, what set might have a small product set? Any suggestions for set with a small product set? Yes, very good, very good. We have a lot of great ideas here. So let's, let, here's this easy example. I'm, uh, I'm going slower than a lot of your answers here. So let's say we take powers of two, two, two squares, two cubed, up to two to the n. Okay, what's the product set here? What's the product set of here, of, uh, of A? Mm-hmm, it's powers of two. Why is that? Oops, yeah, fine. Uh, I, in case you don't remember, we have this identity here that reminds you how to multiply two uh, powers of the same thing. So this gives us two squared, two cubed, two to the four, all the way up to two n. It's very similar to the example from our sum set, except that the numbers from before are now the powers, the exponents. Right? If you look just at the exponents, it's exactly our example from the sum set. The numbers exponents are one, two, three, up to n, and the sums are two, three, four, up to two n. And we got, just like before, um, okay, I have a question, let's see. So, why is the maximum uh, two plus one choose two again. So it's, so let me repeat it. Thank you for asking. If, if, if you missed something, please keep asking those things. I'm not worried about time. If we'll be behind, we'll just skip some part at the end. That's not a problem. So um, how many products can we have? If all the products are different, every two numbers are gonna give us a different product. So that's n choose two, but that ignores the fact that we're allowed to take the same number twice. We're allowed to take the product of the first number with itself, the product of the second number is itself, etc. And if you take this into account and you calculate it, you get n plus one choose two. It's, it's actually, you can think of it as n choose two plus n, all the same thing. Okay. Ah, very nice. People are already telling me what's gonna happen in the next slide. Very good observations, people. So I'm asking you a question, but some of you people already told me the answer. Uh, can we do better? Can we do better? In the sum set, two n minus one was the best we can do. 
No, right? We, we proved that you cannot do better than 2n minus 1. Can you do better with a product? So let me confuse you a bit. In the product set, we can get 1 better, 2n minus 2. There's a way of changing the set, so the number of products is 2n minus 2. It's almost the same, but still not quite. How can we get 2n minus 2? Ah, very good. Okay, so let's see. Uh -huh. So I see all sorts of suggestions. If I start with 2 to the 0, which is 1, if I just add 1, this is not going to change anything. It's still going to be 2n minus 1. But I can do something a bit different. Not add 1, what can I add? Yes, very good people, great ideas. I can add 0. Let's add 0. When I add 0, then, okay, so I, I have to throw away the last element because I want to have n numbers, so I throw away the last element. What's in the product set now? It's the same as before. The, the powers of 2 remain the same as before, but when I added 0, I only added one element to the, to the product set instead of 2. If I added 2 to the n, it would add two numbers to the product set. Adding 0 only adds one number. So we're one less, you can count. And this is the smallest possible. So it's almost the same as before, 2n minus one, 2n minus two, we don't care about such small changes. We care about the difference between n and n squared. This is a huge difference. So um, I can use negative numbers, they're allowed. They're just gonna increase a lot, the number of products. Um, Negative numbers are allowed. They're not going to give me a smaller product set. Uh, okay, so ignoring, ignore this zero technicality. Assume that we're not allowed to include zero for a second. What sets are going to have the minimum product set? What sets are going to have the minimum product set? So in the sum set case, we said that arithmetic progressions are exactly the sets that give us 2 and minus 1. What can be the situation here? Right, very good. So um, some people say powers, right? The official name, the formal name for this is geometric progressions. Geometric progressions means you start with one number and each time you multiply by the same number again and again. So any powers of things are gonna work well or actually any geometric progression is gonna work well. Good, so, so let's repeat the philosophy from before. In some sense, we, wanted to, we, we want to say that, we want to say, uh, I have a question about, okay, I have a question about negative numbers. Let me just answer it quickly. So we don't care about small sets. You wanna imagine that we have sets of a billion numbers, not three numbers that behaves a bit differently if you look at two numbers or three numbers. You want to think of n as very large. Um, okay, so in some sense the philosophy here is that most sets are most sets are uh, will have a very large product set. The product set is going to be about n square, n square over 2, something like that. But there are special sets that have some sort of a multiplicative structure, and this multiplicative structure for, uh, gives them a small product set. Um, small product set, so in this case, there is a geometric progression or things that look like geometric progressions. I have some questions, I'm gonna, gonna answer those in a second. Now I can tell you what the sum product is. What the sum product problem is. Um, so arithmetic progressions have a small sum set. They have a good additive structure, but they have a horrible product set. The product set is close to n squared. Geometric progressions 
have small product sets, but they have very large sum sets. If you check, the sum set is also about n squared. Is there a set of numbers that has both a small sum set and a small product set? Or if you want this in other words, is there a set that has some good behavior with respect to addition? And at the same time, good behavior with respect to multiplication. Is this possible? It's kind of a basic question about the nature of addition and multiplication of numbers, right? Um, while well, you think about it for a second, um, I, uh, let me answer a couple of questions. So people asked if they're allowed to use uh, complex numbers or imaginary numbers. Uh, in general, yes, the answer is yes. But uh, for, to keep it simple, let's, let's, not, let's new, not use complex numbers for the sake of this talk. It doesn't change the problem too much, it seems. Um, so, I didn't quite define the problem properly here. What is a small sum set and a small product set? I don't know. Whatever you find small, whatever you think is small, I'm happy with. Now, but remember that n has to be large. You cannot take a set with one number or three numbers. You have to think of sets that have n numbers where n is something huge, okay? Small examples are not relevant. Okay, so uh, someone suggested that saying small is that's strictly smaller than n squared. Yeah, okay. Um, let's say not close to n squared, both of them. Can such a thing happen? So I have a lot of suggestions here. And uh, let me say while, why all of your suggestions are probably not good. The, the reason most likely our suggestions are not a good example is because we don't know. This is a very difficult open problem, whether such a thing exists or not. So this was originally asked by two famous mathematicians almost 40 years ago, Erdős and Semeredi. And they phrased it in a bit of a tricky way. Let me tell you in a more simple way what they said. They basically conjectured that there's no such set. There's no set with a small sum set and a small product set at the same time. How, how did they phrase it? So they said, again, when n is sufficiently large, you only think about large n. So what's the maximum size of a product set or a sum set? It's about n squared, n squared over two. They said that for any set that you take, Either the sum set or the product set is as close to n square as you like. For example, you can take epsilon to be whatever you want. Take it to be 0 0.1, then the conjecture says that at least one of those two is always at least n to the 1.9. Do you understand what I mean with this maximum here? Let me know if it's not clear. The larger of the two. You can take epsilon to be 0 0.01, and then the conjecture would be that one of them has to be at least n to the 1.9999, and you can, you can keep doing it as small as you like. So basically the conjecture says, take epsilon as small as you like, whatever set, whatever large set you take, one of these two sets is gonna be as close to the maximal as possible, okay? Epsilon, you can take it to be a small number as small as you like. The, the meaning of epsilon here is a tiny number. Take it to be as small as you like. So again, the conjecture is basically that any set, large set of numbers, either at least one of the sum set of the product set would be as close to n squared as you like, but not quite n squared. Why not quite n squared? There's some technicality there. I'm ignoring a lot of technicalities. In fact, throughout this entire talk, I'm lying to you all the time. I, I'm hiding all sorts of small technical issues just to simplify things. And nothing here is accurate. Okay, so do you understand the conjecture? The conjecture is no set or every set 
will have either a sum set close to the maximum size or a product set close to the maximum size. No set can have a good additive behavior, good additive structure, while also having a good multiplicative structure. Okay, now this started as a problem in number theory. This started as a problem in number theory. Now I'm guessing that maybe a lot of you know what number theory is, but I still have an urge to mention it briefly. Number theory is in properties of integers. For example, Euclid proved the number theoretic result. There are infinitely many prime numbers, which you probably also know. Um, Fermat's last theorem, maybe some of you know, states that if you look at this red equation, the there are no integer solutions to it. Oh, I saw people are tangling me that I broke up for a moment. I was just saying that this is a pro started as a problem in number theory, and I started to say what number theory is about. It's just the study of integer, and I'm giving some examples. Um, okay, is that okay? Um, still breaking up a bit? Hmm. Let's, uh, okay, so, okay, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep talking a bit. If this keeps happening that I'm breaking up, let me know and we'll try to figure out to fix this. And one last examples. Um, okay, some people are telling me that I'm fine. I, I okay, I don't know. Um, so the famous result says that every positive integers can be written as a sum of four squares. For example, 15 can be written as one square plus one square plus two square plus three square. Here's the way to do 110. And you can do it always. It doesn't matter what integer you take, there's always a way to write it as a sum of four squares. So you see number theory is basic questions about integers. Um, properties of integers. And let's, say, let's also state a couple of open problems. I'm guessing some of you also know. So for example, we, it's known since Euclid and probably earlier that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Now we conjecture that there are infinitely many twin prime numbers. Twin primes is two primes, two apart. Five and seven are twin primes, 17 and 19 are twin primes, 41 and 43, etc. cetera. Uh, so the conjecture is that there are infinitely many of those also, but it's an open problem. Another interesting open problem you might have seen before is the Goldbach conjecture. It says that every integer except larger than two can be written as a sum of two primes. Very simple to state, right? 20 is the sum of these two, 7 plus 13, 15 is 13 plus two. Every integer can be written as a sum of two primes, every even integer, sorry. But this turns out an to be an extremely difficult problem. People cannot solve it. I put here uh, the cover of a book, Uncle Petros and the Goldbach co and Goldbach's Conjecture. It's, uh, it's a novel, it's a story, a fictional story about a mathematician trying to solve this and going crazy. Fictional, but uh, has a lot of uh, similar cases in reality, I guess. Um, anyway, so this our problem, some product problem, started as a number theory problem. It started as a, as something, as it started, if you remember the Erdős and Samardi conjecture was specifically about integers. And, and it's just about sums and products of integers. It looks like a classical number theory problem. And, and the first people who worked on it were number theory people. And they used, they used number theory tools to study it and they managed to make the first few steps. So for example, Erdős and Samari said, there exists some tiny epsilon. They didn't even figure out exactly what it is. Some tiny epsilon such that for every set, either the sum set or the product set is at least n to the one plus epsilon. The trivial bound is that they're both at least n always. So they managed to get a bit beyond, a bit beyond the trivial set that always one of them is at least one plus epsilon for some tiny epsilon. And later someone showed that it's at least n to one plus one over 32, and some other number theorists improved it to one plus one over 16, but these are very small improvements, right? We're just managing to show that it's always at least, one of them is always at least slightly more than n, very far from n squared. You see what I saw? Um, let me know if not. Then there was a big breakthrough. 
Then a mathematician called Elkesh, instead of thinking of it as a number theory problem, he thought about it as a geometric problem or maybe combinatorial geometry problem. And that, man, that led him to the following breakthrough that uh, improved what we know in two ways. First, he got a bound of n to the one plus a quarter. Still very far from n squared, but a much bigger jump in the bound than the previous results. And it also holds for any real numbers. Not just for integer, it showed that it holds for any real numbers. So you can take irrational numbers if you like, still works. Okay, and, and this was a big, let's call it a paradigm change. Since Eldakesh, all of the people studying the problems, all the progress was made geometrically. People started to think of it geometrically. All of the following results were also ge geometric. Okay, uh, what does that mean? I'm gonna tell you in a minute. So let's just say where we stand now. There was a somewhat of a second breakthrough in uh, 2009, Shoimoshi showed that improved from th uh, five quarters to four thirds still remaining in using geometry, but in a diff somewhat different way. And since then, so we had 11 years passed since then, um, there were a lot of improvements. They were all very small improvements. They were all taking Shoimoshi's proof and improving it by a tiny bit. And there are a lot of improvements. The last one is from two months ago, May 2020. And the best known bound is four thirds plus two over 1,167. Uh, and if you think that's a small improvement, this the first improvements of Shoimoshi were four thirds plus one over 20,000. So, so in some, that's why I'm saying that in some sense, the last major improvement was Shoimoshi. Since then, there were some small improvements. There's constant small improvements even. So that's where we stand. That's, that's the best we know now. That's very far from n squared, right? We always know that for every set, either the sum set or the product set is at most n to the four thirds, so far from n squared. And that's after a lot of works by a lot of famous mathematicians. I should say, as part of my uh, simplifying things, I showed you the simplest variant of this problem. It has more difficult variants. And the more difficult variants which I don't want to get into, you see all sorts of, if you know what field medalists are, field medal is kind of, some might say the, the Nobel Prize of Math. So we have a lot of, all sorts of field medalists studying this and a lot of famous mathematicians. Everything is still far from solved. Okay, so what are we going to do next? This, I'm going to show you how Elakesh made his breakthrough. Um, it's not so hard to follow but it looks a bit crazy. How did, how did he ever manage to think of that? So let's, let's see what he did. As I said, Elikesh's breakthrough was in some sense moving it from being a number theory problem to being a geometry or combinatorial geometry problem. So let's see what he did. To see what he did, first, I, we need one new geometric object that you probably haven't seen before. And that geometric object is an incidence. Let's say we have, by the way, I'm going, if I'm going too fast, you missed something, let me know, I'll repeat. What is an incidence? So let's say we have points and lines in the plane. We're in the plane, we have points and lines. An incidence is a pair, one point, one line, such that the point is on the line. So if I look at this example, there are zero incidences here. There are no points on any lines, right? Can you tell me how, how many incidences are here? Yeah. Uh, good one. There's one pair of point and line such that the point is on the line. That's an incidence. Very good. Thank you for answering. I appreciate it. What about this? How many incidences do I have here? So in this example, there are two incidences. Why two? This point forms an incidence with this line the line, the line with the negative slope, and the point also forms an incidence with the line with a positive slope. So this point forms two incidences, one with each line. Okay, do you understand why this is two incidences? Every pair of one line and one point is an incidence, and we have two such pairs here, okay? 
Can you tell me how many incidences are here? Whoa, so many good answers. Very good. The answer is right. Very good. Thank you, people. You're doing an excellent job here. So I have the answer is indeed six. Why is that? Every point is on two lines, which means that every point forms two incidences. Three points with each with two incidences is a total of six. Do you understand how we count incidences? Is that okay? Any questions? Okay, so your next job is to tell me how many incidents, let's do a sanity check, kind of to see that you're with me. How many incidences do we have in this case? I'll give you a moment. Count your incidences. They're getting a lot of answers. Some good, some close. Okay, so very good. I'm getting a lot of good answers now. The answer is 15. If you got 14 or 16, I don't care. I just wanted to show that you understand what's happening. I don't care if you're not good at counting exactly. Uh, so we have Y15. We have three incidences with this point here, the top left. Three incidences here, so that's six. Three more, three more here? Yeah, three more here, so that's nine. Two more here, so that's um, 11. And four more here, so that's 15, okay? Is that okay? The important thing is do you understand how we got to 15 now? Are you, do you want me to repeat anything? Do you see this? Thank you, everyone. Uh, as I said, I really don't care if you're not good at counting. Uh, so you, you should, uh, a couple of years ago, one of the world's most famous mathematicians these days was on the Colbert Report, that was on Colbert Show. And during the show, he said that 27 is a prime. It happens, it's, uh, it's not the point here. Um, anyway, uh, so, so uh, I mean, in some sense, proving things is very different than knowing how to count. It's okay if you're not good with counting. Uh, or more. <laughs> uh, so uh, we wanna ask a similar question be as before. So uh, let's say that M and N are two huge numbers. I don't care about the case where there are two lines or two points. I, have a care, I care about the case where there are many lines, many points. Um, so someone is asking me why there are scribbles on the screen. I think that's an issue that happens sometimes with Zoom and PowerPoint. Sometimes for some reason it gets these extra scribbles on the screen. So it says, as long as they're small, I don't care if something bothers you, let me know. And I'll, usually when you just turn it off and on again, the, the sharing of the screen is fine. Um, so, so we have M points and N lines. How many incidences can we have? Um, Oh, so the people are claiming someone might have added them by accident. You know what? I'm just going to stop my screen sharing and then start my screen sharing all over again. And let's see if that just solves our problem. Very good. Good. If it bothers you again, let me know. We'll do that again. Okay. Um, so I want to organize my endpoints, huge number of points, and my end lines, huge number of lines, to get a lot of incidences. So for example, if you just wanted to get n incidences, that's very easy. I just put every line such that it contains, sorry, every point such that, so every line such that it contains one point, and I get n incidences, right? Do you think I can do a lot better? If you just want n, that's easy. One, each line needs to be incident to one point. That's very easy to organize. You can even take just one point and put all the lines on it, containing it. How far could you, do you think I can take this? So 
So I'm not allowed to take identical points. Every point has to be different. And similarly, every line has to be different. How many incidences can I get? What do you think? So someone suggested something like M choose N. Uh, we can, the, this, is, uh, this is too much for us. We don't know how to get such a large number. There's no easy way to see the answer here. I'm just asking you to guess by intuition. It's not, you're not expected to solve the problem. It's a problem that's not trivial to solve. Um, so people are suggesting about n squared. Okay, so m times n. So m times, okay, let's think about it. What, how can we get m times n? m times n means we put all of our, uh, all of our points are incident to all of our lines, right? M times N means all of our points incident to all of our lines. This is impossible. Why is it impossible for all of our points to be incident to over all of our lines? Because two lines intersect in at most one point. If you have two lines, they can share at most one point in common. So it should be impossible to get everything is incident to everything. Do you see what I mean? Even if you take two points and two lines, you cannot have both lines incident to both points. So, so M times N is too much for us. Okay, so Erdos. Erdos, I think we need, okay, let's do like, I'm aiming to have a short, there's a lot of math, I'm aiming to have a break in about 10 minutes so everyone can wake up a bit. Let's do about 10 more minutes. Um, so, Erdos constructs the configuration with M points, N lines, and about M to the two thirds, N to the two thirds incidences. And if I ask you to play with configuration, you probably try something similar. He took the points in a lattice, like you can see here. Square root of N by, sorry, square root of M by square root of M lattice. Um, so I have someone telling me that I'm cutting out a lot. Is that a problem on my side or on their side? Am I cutting out a lot? Okay, some people are telling me I'm fine. So I think it might be on your side. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'll get a lot of answers that I'm good. Thank you. So, so you're probably gonna try the same thing. You just do square root of n by square root of n lattice. Takes all the points, take all the points such that, uh, let's say they have x coordinates between one and square root of n and y coordinates between one and square root of n and you get such a lattice and then you'll need to work a bit to figure out Points. If I'm cutting out, ask me to repeat. Uh, and you get, if you do it properly, you get m to the two thirds, m to the two thirds. That's very weird, right? Since one mathematical answer looks like two thirds, two thirds, that doesn't happen. So that led Erdos to say, can you do better? Can you organize your points and lines to get more than two thirds, two thirds incidences? And the answer turned out surprisingly to be no, that's the best you can do. For some reason, Two thirds, two thirds is the correct bound here. And so there's something called the Samaritan Trotter theorem. Samaritan Trotter theorem tells us that the number of incidences between any M points and any N lines is at most M to the two thirds, N to the two thirds times some constant. We don't care. Imagine that there's, I don't know, five there. Okay, some small constant. It's actually, I think it's less than three even, but it really doesn't matter. It's about M to the two thirds, N to the two thirds. And in a confusing turn of events, since then it turns out that other geometric objects have such bounds that two thirds, two thirds. For some reason, this pops up in geometric problems sometimes. I am not aware of any reasonable answer of why. Um, okay, so this problem is solved. The maximum number of incidences between M points and N lines is about M to the two thirds, N to the two thirds. Let's say I'm asking you to come up with a similar problem. A lot of times in math, we have a problem we know to solve, we try to generalize it. What might be, in, what might, if you solve this, what might be the next problem you would like to look at? What other incidence problem can you come up with? Any suggestions? So someone suggested minimum number of incidences. Good idea. Can anyone tell me what's the minimum number of incidences? Ah, very good people. The minimum number of incidences is zero because you can just 
take no point to be on no line. That's very easy to do, right? No points on no lines, and then there's zero incidences. Okay, so this was a good idea to try, but it wasn't really an interesting problem, apparently. So what can be an interesting problem here? So we solved the maximum number of incidences between points and lines. What else can we try to check? Ah, so I have someone suggesting maybe you go to three dimensions. I love it. That's a great idea. Uh, what happens in three dimensions? I like it. Um, okay, if this is solved, uh, I have someone raise their hand. I'm not sure what, uh, if you wanna suggest something, then just, just write it on the chat. Uh, that's uh, write it on the chat. Um, oh, I love it. So someone suggested a problem I like a lot now. What about the maximum number of incidences between M points and N parabolas? And someone else suggested trying in three dimensions. Good ideas. So there are many such incidence problems. You can ask even simpler. Let's say I have circles of radius one. What's the maximum numbers I can have of incidences between M points and N lines of radius one? Um, I don't know. Even though this problem is solved for almost 40 years, almost anything else involving incidences is still open. If you want incidences between points and circles, we don't have a bound. We didn't solve the problem yet. Parabolas didn't solve the bound. You can just say incidences with all curves of degree two. So you can use both circles and parabolas, still open. Um, planes in three dimensions, other objects in higher dimensions, all open. For some reason, the case of lines is much easier than all of the other cases. And now you might complain, okay, Adam, great, but, but who cares? Why do we need a million variants of the incidence problem? What is this good for? Except for that you can publish more papers, sure, but what is it really helping for? Um, so incidence problems, for some reason, they're extremely useful. I don't know why. I don't have a good answer for why. A lot of places in math, outside of this combinatorial problem, outside of combinatorics, there are problems that don't seem related to incidences in any way, like the sum product problem. But once you use incidences, you get much better results for the problem. They appear in a lot of different places. And now we're gonna see how they appear in the sum product problem. Okay, so if you study the sum product problem, then for some reason you get a lot more, you can do a lot better than what was done before. You saw the earlier bounds and then how Elikash got a much better bound. Okay, so <clears throat> I have a question. Where do you see incidences in real life? Um, I could try to give you some answer, but I don't think I have any answer that you're gonna like. In some sense, incidences are useful for theoretical studies. They're used in a lot of other parts of theoretical math, which are then used in real life. And computer science, uh, for example, in computer science, they appear uh, when you pseudo randomness, you're trying to get a computer to do things that look like choosing a random number, for example. Uh, they're a very theor they help in theoretical places usually. Not the so you need to kind of go two steps to get to the real world. Uh, anyway, so here's Elikesh's theorem again. Any set of n real numbers, either the sum set or the product set is at least n to the five quarters. Times some constant, c is a constant, we don't care. Some small constant, I don't know, half, okay? We, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, so, Where's the geometry in this problem? We're just trying to say that either there are a lot of sums or there are a lot of products. How is this useful to us? Uh, sorry, how is incidence? How are incidences useful here? It looks completely irrelevant. But if you use incidence, you can prove this part. So we're gonna create the geometry. Let's see. Yeah, incidence is a geometric object. Thank you for asking this question. Yes, incidences, we call this geometric object. So let's define a point set. I have a set of n real numbers and I have a set of points. And 
sorry, I'm defining a set of points. All the x coordinates are numbered from the product set, from the sum set. All the y coordinates are numbers from the product set. X coordinates sum set, y coordinates from the product set. Do you understand how these points are defined? I get a set A, I define the set of points B. Uh, now I'm looking for a word. Before I was looking for the word arithmetic progression. What, do you know a word that describes such sets? What, what's, it's, it, it's going to be, look different for any set of, for any set A, it's going to, we're going to get a different set of points, but all of these are going to look a bit the same. What word am I looking for? What, what is interesting about all of these sets of points, no matter what's in A? How are they going to look like? Maybe you don't know this word, I don't know. What, what, are, what can you, how can you describe some structure of this set of points, no matter what numbers are in A? Any thoughts? What is this set? Ah, I have a suggestion lattice. It's similar to a lattice, it's not quite a lattice. Yes, very good thought, almost a lattice. Why do I say almost? This is what I call a Cartesian, we call in math, a Cartesian product. So in a Cartesian product, you can imagine that it's a bunch of rows that look the same. All the rows look the same. Equivalently, it's a bunch of columns all looking the same. Why do I say that it's not a lattice? In a lattice, there, in some sense, there are fixed gaps between every two rows and between every two columns. And here the gaps are not fixed. I have a larger gap between these two columns. The important thing here is that the columns are the same, but the gaps between them might change. So this is a Cartesian product. Okay, so we have a set of points. I'm postponing the break a bit. Uh, here's a set of lines. Set of lines. Um, so the line, how can we define a line? A line is defined by a linear equation, right? It's, you can write it to y equals ax plus b. So we're doing something similar. If our lines are all defined by equations of the form y equals some constant c times x minus some constant b. c and d are just numbers from a. And you can think of it in some sense, it's not a Cartesian product of lines, but it's similar. There's the, the slopes of all these lines are all coming from a, and their y-intercepts depend on a in a slightly more complicated way. Okay, so you understand we have a set of points and a set of lines. All right, um, so can, any questions so far? So if you don't have questions for me, I'll have questions for you. How many lines do we have? If you understand how the, can you give me a number that tells me how many lines are in the line set? Remember this absolute value notation is just how many elements are in the set. So how many lines? We have all the lines that look like this, where C is in A and D is in A. So how many lines do I have? Hmm. Okay. Now this is the first time I don't get answers. So we're missing something here. So let's see. Um, so I'm not asking how many lines are specifically in this picture. I'm asking, we have a set A of n real numbers, and then I'm defining the lines like this. How many lines am I going to have? So it's, it's not about the picture. It's about we have a set A of n numbers. How many lines are we gonna have, okay? I already have one correct answer. I want some more. I want a lot more. Ah, oh, good, good, we're making progress. More good answers. Good, thank you, people. Okay, so every line is gonna to correspond to one choice of C and one choice of D. Are you okay with this? Do you see why? For each choice of C and choice of D, I'm gonna get a line. So how many lines are there? How many choices of C do I have? Any so I have some answers, but I want I have several correct answers. Very good, thank you, people. Oh, now I'm starting to get more answers. Thank you. The number of lines is n squared. There are n choices for C and n choices for D. 
So each choice of C and choice of D is going to give me L9. Do you see why? Is that okay? Do you want me to explain this more? Um, if this is unclear, I'm happy to explain this better. Thoughts? Okay. Okay. Um, how many points do we have? Okay, okay, good. Someone asked me, people are asking me to explain a bit better. Let's explain a bit better. So my set of lines, I have a line for each value of C and D. So for example, if one is a number from A, I can take C to be one and D to be one, and I get the line Y equals X minus one, and that's one Y. If I take two other values from A, I get another line. Two other values from A, I get a third line, okay? Every pair of values for C and D are gonna give me a line. Is that okay? Do you see what I mean here? If C is five and D is six, I get a spe one specific line. C is seven and D is 20, I get a different line. So the number of lines is the number of values I can put in C and D. This basically says for every C and D in A, okay? If you're not familiar with this notation, this says for every C and D in A. So I can take C to be any number in A and D to be any number in A. Is that okay? Do, do you understand how this is defined now? Now we have n square ways of choosing values from A to B in C and D. N, n values for C, n values for D. Okay? You know what? Let me, let me do it even slower. Let's say, let's say that A is 1, 3, 10. I'm gonna write it in the chat. Okay, A is now this 1, 3, 10 in the chat. Then I have the line, one line is X minus 10, like this. And another line is gonna be Y equals 3X minus 3. Each choice of C and D from A is gonna give me a different line, okay? I hope that now it makes more sense. If not, let me know, I'll talk about it even more. Okay. So I already got some answers. How many points do I have? How many points do I have in my point set? This is an uglier answer. Can you tell me something about the number of points in my point set? And again, it's not about the figure. It's about A having N numbers, where N can be any huge number, okay? If N is a huge number, how many points am I going to have? So I have a point for each choice of A and each choice of B. A is an element from the sum set, B is an element from the product set. Okay, so how many ways do I have of choosing one number from the sum set and one number from the product set? How many ways can I choose one number from the sum set? Okay. I'll tell you what we're gonna do. I think, okay, now I think I are, so I didn't explain this well, so we're a bit tricky. So some people are having a hard time, so which is fine. Um, so I'm gonna announce what we're going to do now is an officially five minute break. In this five minute break, I'm gonna explain this as much as you like. If you don't wanna listen, go to the best break, go drink something. We're doing a five minute break. I started it in my clock now. We're gonna, after the break, we're gonna finish this proof and then we're gonna talk a bit about very different things, about uh, research for high school students and some other things, okay? So five minute break. Unless you wanna, uh, unless you wanna keep talking about this. Okay, so now I'm gonna do this in a lot more detail. Let's do L again. Let's say I'm gonna write in the chat, set. A is a set of numbers. Just this set that I wrote. Oh, oops, I only wrote it privately. Uh, everyone, A equals one, five, seven, ten. Okay, let's say A is one, five, seven, ten. So what lines do we have? We're gonna have a line where C can be any value from A and D can be any value from A. So for example, when C is one and D is five, we get the line 
y equals um, x minus 5, if I didn't do any mistake. Is that okay? Do you see why? When c is 5 and d, c, c and d can be any numbers from a, when c is 1 and d is 5, that's the line we got. When c is 10 and d is 3, we get the line, let's see, uh, y equals 10x minus 30. Okay, do you see how every two values of C and D give us a different line? But it's always C and D come from the set A. How many lines am I going to have in this case? I have four choices for C and four choices for D, each giving a different line. Very good. Right? So a total of 16 lines. Any questions so far? Stop me if something is not clear so far. Okay, good. Uh, I'm, I'm not getting to the points yet. Now, in general, in general, we have n options for n choices for C and n choices for D, so n square lines. In general, we have, yes, exactly. I have four options, four times four before. Now, but in general, I actually have n options for C and n options for D, so n times n is n squared. Okay, does this make more sense about the lines? I don't want to talk about the points. Yet. First, I want to see that no one is asking me more questions about the lines. Are we okay with this or do you? Okay. No more questions about how we got the problem for the lines? Okay, then we're gonna, we have one and a half minutes left in the break. When we've done with the break, we're gonna get to the points. You might wanna think about what's the answer for the points in the meantime. I'll, I'll take a minute not to talk. Okay, let's let's settle back to see what we're, where we stopped exactly before. Mm, here, okay, okay. So, by the way, I, I want to say thank you to all the people who kept asking me about the lines. It's my job here. I mean, sometimes I go too fast, and and I'm very happy that I have people here who are telling me. To, to repeat something until it's clear. Very good work. Okay, so what's the set of the, what's the size of the set of points? I have, can anyone tell me, anyone tell me, if you understand it also, great. <laughs> also take it. Can anyone tell me, then maybe you can tell me what's the number of, what's the size of the point set? Anyone tell me that? Okay, so I get all sorts of bounds. 
Uh, there are different answers that you can say are valid answers in this case. I wanted to use this answer. So it's the size of the sum set because there are sum set options of choosing A. And there are people in the waiting room that are not, uh, okay, never mind. So there are size of the, the number of choices for A is the size of the sum set. The number of choices for B is the size of the product set. I got a, lot of, a bunch of people saying that, very good work. You understand, is it clear why? The same as before, except instead of N times N, we have the size of the sum set times the size of the product set. Okay, we're trying to get a bound for the sum product problem. Why are we defining, why are we talking about sizes of sets of points and lines? How is this related to anything? We wanna count the number of incidences, okay? Let's count how many incidences we have. Any thoughts about how we can say anything about the number of incidences here? Why can we say something? There are several different things we can say about the number of incidences. Any thoughts what we might be able to say? Anyone? How can we get any bound, anything about the number of incidences? We have points and lines, we wanna count the incidences. I mentioned before a tool that tells us something about the number of incidences. Do you remember roughly what it was? So there was this result Uh, oh, I have all sorts of interesting suggestions here. Very nice um, about ways to count it. I like it, yes. Um, so first, we already had a theorem that we can apply. So we can just plug in the number of, uh, we can just plug in the Samaritan Trotter theorem. Ah, oh, thank you. Very good, very good. Samaritan Trotter theorem tells us if we have some number of lines and some number of points, the maximum possible number of incidences that we can have is some small constant, points to the two thirds, lines to the two thirds. Is that okay? We're just applying, we're just applying this, this theorem we saw before. Number of incidences is always points to the two thirds, lines to the two thirds, okay? Why is it in this case? You can just apply, uh, we know what L, L is as n squared and we have something about P. So L to the two thirds is N to the four thirds and P to the two thirds is something else. The number of incidences is at most this scary looking expression. Okay, Do you, doesn't matter what it means. You, you understand how we got it? Just apply the summary Trotter theorem from before. Maximum number of incidences is points to the two thirds, lines to the two thirds. Thank you everyone, very good get a lot of answers. Okay, let's count incidences in a more elementary way. Forget about the summary Trotter now. Let's consider, let's do something very elementary, not using any heavy tools. Let's take a line. So I take a specific line, C is one specific value of L, imagine it took one C from L, and D is one specific value of L, so we have one specific line defined by this equation, okay? Maybe C is five and D is 10, doesn't matter. Can you find points on P that are incident to this line? How can I show that there are points of P that are going to be on this line? For specific C and specific D, doesn't matter what they are, I can show that there are points from P that are going to be incident to this line. Any thoughts about how? Yeah, that's a bit trickier to see. I'll give you a moment more in case you want to think about it. How can I show that there are going to be points on P from our point set on a fixed line? Right, good. So how do I check that the point is on a line? It, it, the coordinates of the points needs to satisfy this equation. Oh, very good, very good. Some people are giving me good ideas. Yes, we need specific points from P that satisfy this equation. So take 
a prime. A prime is another number from A, okay? Just a number from A, any number, I don't care. And now look at this, look at this point. This is a point from P. The X coordinate is from the sum set. It's this C plus our new A prime. And the Y coordinate is from the product set. So it's this C from here times A prime, which is also from A. How do I know that this point is on our line? Why do I know that this point is on our line? I plug in, I plug, so I have a point, sum of two numbers from A, product of two numbers from A, and I want to see that it's on this line. So what's going to, how do you check that the point is on a line? You plug in the coordinates of the point and you want to check if they satisfy this equation, right? So what's the Y coordinate? C A prime, excellent. What's the, what's on this side? Can you tell me what's on the right hand side? So I take X, D plus A prime and I put it here. And then I have plus D minus B that gets canceled, right? And I get C A prime also. So it's also C A prime. So I have C A prime on both sides. So this point is on the line. How many points did I just find on my line? How many points are on this line? Satisfy this in this way? Can you tell me? So I, I just show you how to find one point. One point, take an A prime from A and put it here. Okay, so someone suggested infinite. There are infinitely many points on the line, but there are finitely many points in P. P is our point set, right? So I can take any A prime that I like from A. For any A prime that I took, I take, I get a point, a different point that's on my line, right? For any a choice of A prime, I get a different point that's on our line. There, so I got N points from P that are on my line. Maybe there are more, but there are at least N. Do you understand how I got at least N? There are N options for A prime. Each of them gives me a different point on our line. So every line has at least N incidences by this elementary counting. Every line has at least N incidences. So the number of incidences, even if you didn't follow exactly, it's enough to, to, to believe us that every line has at least n points on it. So the number of incidences is at least the number of lines times the number of points. There are n square lines, each has n incidences, we have at least n cube points, okay? And this is almost the end of the proof. What did we do? Even if you didn't quite follow how we got this bound, we just, we just, First, we used Semmerle Trotter theorem, just applying it. We got the, the number of incidences is the most this weird expression. Then we, we did a small elementary counting and we got that the number of incidences is at least n cubed. We can put them in one equation. The number of, this is the number of incidences, this i expression, it's at least n cubed and it's most this scary looking expression. Okay, do you understand how we got it? Why did I put, so, I'm going, I'm going to, it's okay if, I don't care uh, so much if you missed the last slide. The, the important thing to remember from it is we just found a way to show that the number of incidences is at least n cubed. Okay, that's all we needed from it. We can talk about it more if you want later. I, am, I'm, I want to finish this proof so we can talk about quickly about a couple of other things. So I, I want to, it's okay if you, you didn't see quite how we got this one. Can anyone guess why I wanted to put this all in one equation? instead of these two separate equations, why does it help me? <clears throat> I can now throw the middle. If this is small, n cube is smaller than this, and this is smaller than that, it means that n cube is smaller than that also, right? Okay, are you okay with this? I just threw away the middle. Okay, I wanna simplify this a bit. 
How can I simplify this equation? Any suggestions for simplifying this calculate the standard calculation? Ah, I like it. Very nice ideas. <coughs> uh, yeah, I, oh, very good, people. You have a lot of good ideas. I like it. Let's do it in the order I thought about it. So the first thing, I don't like that there's n on both sides. Let's just divide by n to the four thirds. And I also decided to divide by c because I want the sum set and the product set to be alone on one side. Okay, I just divided both sides by c and four thirds. But I still don't like is that uh, I don't like these two thirds, two thirds. I don't want to. I, I just want to have the sum set and the product set here. How can I get just the sum set and the product set here instead of this? How do I get rid of the two thirds, two thirds? Some people already told me. How do I get rid of two thirds? Yes, very good. I can. You, have, you say the same thing in a lot of different ways. One way to say it is take both sides to the power of three halves, okay? Some people answered uh, different answers that are equivalent. Let's take the power of three halves to both sides. So now I have this equation, okay? What did we, let, let's, let's do a quick recap. We counted the number of incidences in two different ways, compared them, simplified, and got here. And this is the end of the proof. Why is this the end of the proof? I switched sides now. This is the same equation, I just switched the sides. Why does this tell me something about the sum set and the, the sizes of the sum set and the product set? What does it tell me about them? We have this. What does it say about the size of the larger one? Their product is at most n to the five halves. So one of them has to be at least what? <clears throat> One of them, so the constant we don't care too much about. The constant is not the important thing. The important thing is the n to the five halves. If their product is at least n to the five halves, very good, I have a lot of good answers here. If the product is n to the five halves, then at least one of them needs to be at least n to the five quarters. Why is that? Imagine that both of them are smaller than n to the five quarters, then their product is gonna be smaller than n to the five halves. For the product to be at least n to the five halves, one of them has to be at least n to the five quarters. Ah, yes, yes. I see people suggest all sorts of ways of looking at it, like the mean inequality. Yes, very good. It's basically mean, yes. Um, okay, is that clear? Do you see? So we solved the sum product. We got Elekesh's bond. We got a nice bond for the sum product problem. Either the sum set is n to the five quarters or the product set is n to the five quarters. At least one of them is like that. This is just a small constant that we don't care about. Uh, I was... Um, someone asked me if it's going to be 25 over 16. No, no, you don't uh, take the square of the exponent. It, taking this, taking the... You never need to take the square of the, ex, the numbers in the exponent. Uh, it's just one of them has to be larger than the square root of this. Square root of this is n to the five quarters. C is n to the five quarters. Okay, so what happened here? How did we get a nice bound for the sum product problem? This is a mathematical idea called dynamic, uh, sorry, called double counting. In double counting, so we have a problem that we wanna get a bound for some object. In this case, the sum product expression. We define a different object and count it in different ways. Here's the big picture. We define an incidence problem. We counted the number of incidences in two different ways. We got the bound we wanted. And this is a common idea, this double counting. Sometimes you have a problem that looks like a very, that is a very difficult problem. You don't know how to address it. People are stuck with it for decades. But if you can figure out what's a good ob related object to double count, suddenly it looks easy. Suddenly you can explain its proofs in a few minutes. Uh, it's a very interesting tool for proving things. You find something else, count it in two different ways and compare them. Okay, you see what we did? Okay. Um, so I've been asked to talk a bit also about the research mentoring that I do. If there are 
if you don't mind me say something more about this double counting, I guess it's a good time to talk about that. So um, me, together with some friends, we do a lot of types of research mentoring of students. For example, uh, this was supposed to be the break. For example, uh, we have a summer research program. Every summer, we bring a group of college students to New York. We usually get over 400 applications and we bring just a few. Uh, and the students, they don't get to enjoy New York too much. They work very hard in the summer on math research and almost everyone gets strong math results at the end of the summer, publish them in strong papers. And so far everyone got into top PhD programs in math or computer science or some other related thing. And we do others, this is pictures from last year. This year, everything is remote. And we do other things. Uh, for example, this year, because of the virus, a lot of student, uh, college students got stuck at home with no summer program. So I created a new program for this summer. Um, it's an online program, has more than 300 participants from around the world. They're all college students who have math, usually math majors with proofwriting background. And they work in big groups on research projects. We have 12 projects in different, very different mathematical fields. Each project is run by a professor who's an expert on that field. And uh, that's what we, these days, they all work a lot on their projects. And, and we do a lot more such research mentoring, but I suspect if you, if this is something that's interesting to you, you don't want to hear about projects for college now, right? Maybe in a few years, you'll want to hear a few projects about college students. Uh, but we also do work with the high school students. With high school students, it's a bit different. We don't have a program, organized program, where there's structure and everything is known exactly what needs to happen. There's a time frame, etc. What we do is that once in a while, some um, high school student comes to us and that high school student is someone who looks promising and wants to do research. And then we assign them a mentor and they do research. And uh, let me say a bit more about this. So these are longer projects. It's not enough to have just like eight weeks or something like we do with college students. Usually the high school student needs a few weeks to just read enough background to be able to think about the problem. Uh, so it's also during the year, it's not in the summer. Uh, but the goal remains the same. Um, the goal still remains to prove an open problem in math and publish a research paper. So these are weaker results than the college students do, but they're still real mathematical results for real mathematical problems and they're published in journals. Weaker journals in this case, but still real journals. Um, for example, this year we had a student uh, we had a student that was actually at uh, the New York Math Circle at some point, and he made he proved a very nice results about something called coloring of the plane. You need to color the points in the plane with colors. Never mind. And he published a paper about it, and um, he also got accepted to almost every college he wanted to, and had a hard time choosing where he wants to go. And eventually, he decided to go to Caltech. Um, so, how does this work? Uh, so you work closely with a mentor, so it could be me, but it could be one other, a different person in a group. All mentors are professors, math professors that are active researchers and all have experience mentoring research projects. And first the mentor provide reading material. After that, the mentor needs to choose a problem. And this is actually the, this is the most difficult part of the work of the mentor. If I just asked you to find a math problem that you like to work on, most likely you'll come up with a problem that's either extremely hard and you shouldn't work on it, or that it's trivial for some reason. If you know the right technique, it becomes trivial or maybe it's already known or something like that. So the mentor, the hard work is to find a problem that's on the one hand, it's interesting enough so it can be published in a real research journal uh, and the, this is, I'm talking about, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, and on the other hand, it needs to look to the mentor plausible enough that we can solve it for the high school student to still be able to solve it. Uh, um, it sounds hard and it is hard. Uh, it is hard to do such a thing, but we're doing it. We regularly have high school students that, uh, that 
published, have nice results. And publish them in, uh, in journals. And the way you do it is you regularly meet with the mentor and the mentor suggests all sorts of approaches, all sorts of approaches, what might be tools to look at that might be useful for the problem, etc. It, it has to be something in the area of expertise of the mentor so that we'll have a chance of uh, solving the problem. Um, okay, one more thing I wanted to say about this. It, this is a bit of a weird thing to do, right? High school students doing, uh, solving open mathematical research problems. This is not a common thing. Most people don't do such a thing, and there's a good reason for that. It's not, I don't think it should be for most people. Um, it's, it's not just one extracurricular activity. You can't just say, oh, I'm gonna spend an hour a week on that, uh, I'll do what I'm told, and that's it. It's very energy, it demands a lot of energy, time, but more, even more so energy. You're struggling solving an open problem, and you're not sure if you're doing anything that's relevant to solving it, and you're not sure if you just need a bit more work or you need months of more work, or maybe the problem is completely unsolvable, uh, or, this can be this can be a struggle. It can be frustrating, and it requires a lot of mental energy. Why would you do that? Why would you just spend a lot of time and energy and maybe frustrations on doing this? So, usually, this is mostly useful for people who know that they want to do a lot more advanced math. So, it's useful mostly if you think you want to study math in college, or maybe even more than that, and you think that you do have enough motivation and time to, to, to work hard on solving a research problem. Um, and I guess we only have 10 more minutes left. Originally I was planning to, I was planning to show you briefly Obviously, some product is not a good for problem. It's too hard for high school students or an undergraduate. It's a hard problem. But, uh, but there are variants of it that are actually doable. And I have been working on related problems with, well, not with, a, specifically on that, not with high school students, but with college freshmen, with two freshmen from college, and they made a lot of results. So you can say they know a bit more than a high school student, but not too much more. But we're out of time, or we have 10 minutes, so I think instead, Let's just skip to the end of this. And if any of you are awake, um, you are welcome to ask questions now. I can talk more about math, more about the sum product problem, more about this high school research, more about how this is related to cats. I don't know, whatever you wanna ask about. Or you can email me later also. Here's my email. You're always welcome to contact me. Mm. So, uh, any any questions? Anybody wants to talk about anything? Are everyone asleep or just over? Don't have what to talk about. <laughs> okay. So okay, now I got a bunch of questions. Um, Okay, applications of some product. Someone asked, what are the applications of some product problem? So you might have noticed, this is a problem in, so math is kind of, there's a fake split of it into pure math and applied math, where applied mathematicians, what they do, it's kind of a lie, but what they do in some sense is they try to apply mathematical tools to solving real life problems. And, And, uh, and pure math mathematicians, they take pure math problems that seem to be relevant, interesting, open, hard, requiring new tools or anything like that, and they study those. So there's kind of two steps here. And if you just look at the sum product directly, then it's a problem in pure math studied by pure mathematicians. So you, that means in some sense that you currently need two steps to get to the real world from it. Um, if you want, I can show you how computer scientists, I can send you links at least, to how computer scientists acquire the sum product problem for all sorts of problems, algorithmic problems, other complexity problems, things in computer science. Uh, but, but what I'm trying to say 
is that just to show you how this is uh, applied somewhere, you also need to do some work. This is a very theoretical thing, so it's kind of two steps to see how it's connected to the real world. If you want, send me an email, I'll send you all sorts of links to see examples. But uh, yeah, if you want to work on things, that, if you're more interested in things that are directly related to the real world, then you should go more to p applied math or computer science or physics and not to pure math. Uh, and uh, I can talk for hours now about how this approach works, how for the, during the entire human history, there are problems, mathematicians worked on theoretical problems, even if they don't know, didn't know any applications for them. And then they became very important to things in the real world. Number theory is field that we mentioned was a field in, of math since the ancient Greeks and before. It never had any application until the 20th but now uh, number theory is the basis of all modern cryptography. The way that your credit card number is secure online, directly related to number theory. And that happens again and again. Uh, all sorts of crazy geometry that no one thought that would be relevant to the real world turned out to be what Einstein needed for his theory of relativity, etc. So that's what pure math does. They study the pure math problems and it takes some time to see connections to the real world. Okay, let's see what other questions do I have here. Uh, so, someone asked me about the research. How many hours does someone have to work a day? So this is not a daily work, obviously, but, and I cannot give you a number of hours that you need to do. For, for such a research project. I, what I can do actually is connect you to people who already did it and they can tell you what they did. But uh, um, when you work on a math problem, you have no idea how much work it's gonna, re it's gonna require. You're not sure if you're gonna solve it in a day or in a few months from now. So it's basically regularly spending time trying to think of it. It's not that every day you have to do something, but if you're just gonna think of it as an hourly think that you just do what you're told, it's not going to work. It's more, you need a bigger time. Someone asked me if I think that this problem is ever going to be solved. I assume that, I assume that they meant the sum product problem. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I don't know. I think it's possible. There are mathematical problems that seems a lot like we really don't have the right tools to solve at all. I'm not sure that this is the case. It, it seems like a problem that maybe you just need some very clever person to come up with the right thing to double count or the right tool to use and then it will be, we'll have a big breakthrough for it, but it's hard to say. Um, and yeah, I was asked if you're if you have decided you are maybe interested in such a program. Talk to me, email me, okay? Email me about it if you think that this might be relevant for you. Um, so I have <laughs> someone is asking. Um, okay. Uh, Let's see what other questions do I have here. Um, how much time do we even have? We have three minutes. Okay, let's see if I can answer some more questions before. As I said, I don't have time to answer all questions here, but I'll be available by email. You're always welcome to contact me if you like to ask me more questions. You you have my email. Uh, you have my email here, but also if you just Google my name and math. It would just be all the first few results. No, it should be easy to find. Okay, someone asked if I do contest math. I don't do contest math. Um, I, uh, I, my focus is on research, is on mentoring research projects. Uh, you have wonderful people doing contest math in New York and contest math is wonderful. And I think it's, it's something that fits more people than doing high school math research. It's a great thing to do. I don't. By the way, one of the people in my group that mentor high school students and college students has a gold medal in the IMO, for example. But 
that's not what we're doing now. We are uh, focusing on research mentoring. Okay, I'm sure that uh, the math circle would be able to tell you a lot, lot more about math related. And if I remember correctly, next week you have a speaker that's about math competitions. You should talk to him. Yes, exactly. Uh, next week you have a talk that's much more competition oriented. Okay, so uh, I guess it's 3 p 258. Uh, I guess this is a good time for us to uh, to, uh, to stop. Um, unless you think there's an important problem, anything else that's important to discuss now, otherwise email me later. Will I be able to share the slides? Yes, I am happy to share the slides and then you can see also the more advanced problem I didn't get to, but it's a bit hard without my help, I think, to read it carefully. Uh, I'm happy to share the slides and, you know. Okay, so uh, what do we do now that, uh, that we're done? Is there anyone from the math circle that's here to say something about the, the end of this? Let's see if this would... Yeah. Uh, Kovan, I think you're muted. That's why you, we cannot hear you. 